Yes, ma'am. Did you raise your hand or were you fanning yourself? Well, I'm one-eyed and my right ear don't work too good. Could you say that slowly one more time again like you were talking to a Norwegian or something? <laughs> when you are writing your characters, are they based on people that you know or are they based on um, people that you know? That's a good question. When I write my characters, are they based on people I know? Well, the answer obviously is yes and no. I mean, you, you're only a, you're a fool if you, and, and Jim, I, I, that's one thing he told me, and I remember that. I was having a little trouble with my main character in Better Times Than These, and he said, let me tell you, he said, make that character as different from you as you possibly can. He said, because if you don't, if you make him like yourself, there will be a time, I guarantee you, that he is going to do something or have to do something and that is out of character for you, and you will have lost control of that character. He said, make him as different, and, and, and my character was an officer, obviously sort of like myself, from the South, in an Army unit, and so what I do? I'm from Mobile, Alabama. I'm an Episcopalian. I made him a Jew from Savannah. <laughs> uh, and that was good advice. I mean, you, you, you detach yourself from your characters because there's going to be enough of you in, in not just your main character, but in all of your characters. Uh, because that's all you know. I mean, you know, unless you're a mind reader and can read everybody else's mind around you, all you know is what you know. And the, the way I do it is just try to get a feeling like some characters, will be, they're all going to be composites. Um, and somehow that composite molds and shapes itself and finally comes out in the cookie cutter into a whole different character than even the composite parts of it. So. Yes, sir. Uh, being from Alabama uh, and other writers like this. Yeah, we're going to win this weekend. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> The question is that, like Conroy and, and Bill Steyer and authors from the South, I guess we're talking about the South, have a better perspective. Hell, I don't know. I mean, it's a different one. You know, some of us have a tradition of storytelling. But, you know, when you go looking at some good writers, I mean, Jim Doan wasn't from the South. Mailer, Shaw, all that. I mean, you know, uh, Malmud. I mean, there's, there's talent all over the place. It may. It maybe takes a different form. Um, but I can't imagine what would have happened if, if say, Faulkner had been born in Minnesota. But it's worth, it, it would be worth imagining just for the hell of it. Yeah, somebody else. Yes? By him or about him? I, well, he, uh, he's the reason I'm still around and keep getting invited to these places, I guess. Um, no, it was, a, it was a fun book to do. I did it, gee, in six weeks, maybe not even that long. And uh, it was just a whim I got. Uh, that my, my father had told me a little story. He was an old lawyer in Mobile and told me, about growing up down there, and there was this <clears throat> little boy in the neighborhood who was retarded, what they call him in those days, is another word for it now. And the other kids used to tease him and chase him, and all of a sudden the boy's mother bought him a piano, a bought a piano, and it, within a few days this gorgeous music came wafting out of the house. And he, I'm talking about my daddy's day, which would have been, you know, 1920s or earlier. And the other kids decided that, that was enough, and they quit teasing him and chasing him, and now that to start protecting him. And I thought, you know, 
first of all, recognize what that was, which is an idiot savant, you know, people who basically can't tie their own shoelace but can do mathematical problems and in infinite complexities. And I said that I'm going to go home that night and make a note so I don't forget this because maybe I can use it someday in a, as a scene in a book. And by midnight that same night, I had the first chapter of Forrest Gump written. It was done. I had the character, I had the name, I had the dialect, all that. And that, that'll happen every, I mean, it'll never happen again. I remember Joe Heller told me one time he thought that, that Catch-22 had written himself. I didn't believe it. I don't still don't believe it. But uh, I think Gump came as close as I've ever seen it to doing that. It just, I didn't have a net. I didn't have an outline. I didn't have notes. I didn't have anything. I just sat down in the morning and said, what's he going to do today? And it, it came like that. And then, of course, the movies got a hold to it. And everybody made a lot of money and had a lot of fun. Yes, Since this is a film festival, I do have to ask about the film for stuff. Did you have a lot of say in uh, the film itself? Or yeah. did you, did you, were you hands off or did you use more hands on in the film? The film, okay, well, I'll tell you, I tried to stay away from it. Um, I, I've had other movies made out of books that I've written, and I, I, it's one of the most boring things you have to see. I mean, people doing the same thing over and over. And it makes them all nervous when the writer's on the set because they think you don't like them and all that. And I really didn't have much reason to. They asked me a couple of times when they were shooting over, over you know, in the south up there around Savannah and Bluffton to come up there, and I didn't. Um, the one thing I did do <laughs> was one of the producers called me up and they said, look, we want to use, because here's that football scene where Forrest Gump plays football for Bear Bryant at the University of Alabama. And they said, well, we would like to use the University of Alabama to shoot there and, you know, use that as a background, use the stadium, do all that kind of thing. So I said, oh, I tell you what, send me the script. So they sent the script, and in the script there were some things that uh, let's just say they were historically inaccurate. And I said to this guy, Charlie, what the hell's his name? He was the associate producer. I said, look, you ought to change this. This is not right. He said, no, no. He said, look, colleges love this. It gives them big publicity. And, you know, they, they, they love to get, they don't care what is right or not and all that. I said, well, let me tell you this. I will send this along to uh, Dr. Witt, who is the president of the University of Alabama, who I know, but I said, if I do, I, I, I predict that he will be distressed. Said, no, 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 no. He said, just send it along. I said, it's okay. So I sent it up there, and about a week later, get another call about 8 o'clock at night, because they're on California time out there. We have, I was at a dinner party. Well, this Charlie, the producer, and he's all upset. He said, Damn, he said, what? I don't, we don't understand this. He said, we not only got a letter from the university saying we can't shoot a movie there, we got a letter from their lawyers saying we can't even use the name of the University of Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we solved that finally, but it got their attention. And, and uh, there, there were little things like that, but it, it, nothing, nothing big. And I, I like to tell that because you know, it's not often you can get, get one up on a movie company. They, they usually one two steps ahead of you. But um, I thought they did a remarkable job on the movie. I mean, I, I wrote a whole different script and did two or three verses of it. And I got, I may have preferred my script, which case the movie wouldn't open. I just damn glad they did what they were.